Good afternoon. Welcome to the first of our Holy Week services. Monday is always a really quiet start, uh, so it doesn't matter that there's just a few of us. And if you're watching this online, uh, welcome to the first of our little series of Holy Week services. If you're here in the cafe enjoying your lunch, please carry on. Uh, we'll have a little half hour service here, uh, as we'll do each day during this week. And I should say that on Friday, the cafe and Saturday, actually the cafe and next Monday, Friday, Saturday, Monday, the cafe will not be open. Um, so on Friday, we'll just have our Good Friday service at 1.15, which will last a little bit longer, uh, uh, apart from the others, which will all just be the usual midweek half hour service. So let's take a moment then as we come to worship, just to pray, focus our minds, let the noises around us fade into the background. Let's pray together. Loving Lord, our Heavenly Father, thank you for this special week, for its focus and invitation to join anew the journey from the Mount of Olives through the temple courts to an upstairs room and a garden to places of interrogation and finally to places of abuse and violence and to a cross outside the city walls. Lord, you invite us to come as pilgrims, to walk on that journey, to pick up some of the sense of the events of that few days in Jerusalem, and to journey with you, Lord. Lord, we ask that you open our eyes, that you help us to see and understand a little bit more than perhaps we have before, of all that that journey meant and means, of all that it entailed, and of the depth, Lord, of your willingness to suffer and sacrifice in order to rescue us from our sins, from ourselves and from our sinful inheritance as sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. So meet with us, Lord, today and throughout this week, we pray. Have your way in this place. Glorify your name, we ask, through Jesus. Amen. So we're going to sing two verses of Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. Uh, and happily, we no longer need to wear masks, so that's great. So let me invite you to stand and sing. So we pray again. And this time, include the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. In the midst of turmoil and chaos, in the words of Psalm 46, you are our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. And in that Psalm, Lord, you call us to trust your presence and your power, even though the world fall down around our ears. Your command to us to be still and know that you are God. And so, Lord, in amongst the noise and the hubbub of a city, in amongst a world still in the grip and wrestling with the effects and after-effects of a pandemic, in a world where violence and war, famine and suffering, the wrestling of parties for power and control is all around us, we seek and believe in your peace, your stillness and your presence. We believe, Lord, that you are continuing to advance your kingdom in the world and in human hearts. And whilst the forces of evil and darkness fight back, we believe, Lord, that we are on the victory side. We believe, Lord, that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we believe, Lord, that your kingdom established will finally rule and reign and so, Lord, as we come to you, we are glad to pledge anew our allegiance to that kingdom, to take our stand and to seek your face and to listen, Lord, through your word in the power of your spirit for your word to us this day. Lord, we thank you that you in your grace and kindness have met us in our need and that this journey to the cross reminds us of what you were willing to do to save and rescue us. We come and ask for your forgiveness and you for our sins this day. 
And we come, Lord, to take our stand with you and with all our brothers and sisters throughout the world. And we ask, Lord, that we might find inspiration, courage, hope, and confidence in your word. So hear us as we pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. This year I'm wanting to look at the gospel, the, the, the Passion Week, through the lens of Matthew's gospel. In previous years we've looked at Mark and Luke, so it's Matthew's turn this year. So they're going to look at two little passages together from Matthew 21. The context for this is that Jesus has just come into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, uh, which no doubt you celebrated uh, where you worship on a Sunday yesterday. And Jesus then went, according to Matthew, into the temple and overturned the, the tables of the traders that were in the outer courts, the, the court of the Gentiles, the most outermost court of the temple. And at the same time, after he'd done that, he healed the blind and the lame and those who came to him. And so he already had a bit of a run-in with the Sadducees the priestly ruling party who were in charge of the temple and all of its rituals. And so after that, Jesus leaves uh, Jerusalem. And then on the next day, we have the little story, which I've preached on in the past, of Jesus cursing a fig tree, a symbolic moment where Jesus, who fed 5,000 people from five loaves and two fishes and could quite easily have commanded figs to appear on a tree, was not uh, angry or frustrated because he was hungry and took his power out on the tree, but rather used that as an illustration of God coming to seek fruitfulness in the lives of his people, of a God who has the right to seek good fruit from his people, just as he has an expectation, we might have an expectation to find good fruit on a tree. And so the curse is a symbolic act because the tree withers. It's a warning, a warning shot as he goes into the temple and is going to be confronting the Sadducees and the Pharisees and looking for fruitfulness from people who say that they represent God and ought to produce it. But will he find fruit or will he just find leaves? Will he find the display? Will he find the clothes and the power and the appearance and all the external signs? of godly people, but yet people who are not producing the fruit of humility, of repentance, of a heart uh, attitude towards God that is pleasing to Him and that is full of faith. And so that's the context for this reading. And so we're going to read from verse 23 of chapter 21 as Jesus enters the temple courts. Jesus entered the temple courts and while He was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness 
and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Amen. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, hailed by crowds of adoring and hopeful disciples, is the standout of Palm Sunday. It's a visually exciting spectacle. Churches forever have been acting it out with donkeys and palm branches and cloaks and all manner of things because it's perfect children's theatre. And we can easily picture the scene with the donkey or the donkeys, the mother and the colt, the crowds, the waving branches, the cloaks on the road. What, of course, might be less obvious if we had been there at the time. Less obvious to the casual observer would be the undercurrents of emotion going on. Sure, there was the excitement and the expectation on the part of the crowds of Jesus' disciples and those who were joining him, largely from Galilee, who had seen and heard much of his teaching and his miracles. Theirs was the anticipation that here was the powerful Messiah come to deliver the Jewish people. On the other hand, of course, there would have been a sense of confusion or or bemusement on the part of the Jerusalem crowds and other visitors who had come from all around the Jewish diaspora where Jewish communities were, were scattered. There were large numbers of Jewish people living in other parts of the world And they traveled to Jerusalem, many of them, at least once in their lifetime for the Passover festival. The Jewish historian Josephus records that the population of Jerusalem would swell to around 2 million people during the Passover season, which is approximately 25% more than the current population of Greater Glasgow. Not just Glasgow City, but Greater Glasgow, which is about 1.68 million. So can you imagine in a relatively small city an influx that had swelled the population to two million? People camping everywhere, no hotels. So people just uh, living where they could pitch a tent. And can you then imagine the sense of heightened alert and threat on the part of the occupying Roman forces? They had already experienced uh, revolt and insurrection. They'd already experienced the resistance of zealous Jews, the zealots and others. Barabbas was an insurrectionist. A man called Bar Kokhba had uh, led a revolt decades before, which had resulted in a standoff at Masada. And so there was already a climate of resistance to Rome. And if you've got 2 million Jews who are gathered in the city, and if those 2 million Jews are gathered, why to celebrate Passover? And what was Passover? But Passover was a reminder of the time that God delivered his people out of the hands of the Egyptians, an enemy foreign people. And so if ever there was a festival in the course of the calendar year that would heighten a sense of God being one to deliver his people from foreigners, it was Passover. So two million excited, animated Loyal, partisan, zealous Jews gathered in one place, the Romans would have been on high alert. And meanwhile, of course, you've got the temple and the priesthood, controlled by the party, the party of the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the party that contained the chief priests and all of the priesthood. So it was the Sadducees that controlled the temple, its worship, its rituals, its sacrifices. And so the Sadducees were the powerful people. Well, can you imagine if suddenly one of the festivals is upon you where the population is up to two million and vast numbers of people are there in order to see or to take part in the temple rituals. So they would draft in all the priests available. The the turnover, the the numbers of priests uh, doing shifts in the temple and the the special extra services and assemblies and meals and offerings and so on. And because the temple was under the control of the Sadducees, they would be on high alert too, to assert their control. To say, do this, don't do that. Go here, don't go there. They would be the ones making sure that everybody knew and respected that they were calling the shots. So can you imagine that collection? 
of expectation amongst the disciples from the north, of bewilderment amongst this huge surge of people from all over the place, of the tensions in the Roman forces, of the uh, self-importance and the need to assert their power and dominance on the part of the Sadducees. Here is a cocktail of humanity that is electric with excitement and tension, apprehension, unrest, nationalist anticipation. Resources would be stretched. People would be everywhere. And so when Jesus overturns some tables in the outer courts of the temple to make a point about the temple being for God and not for trading, you can understand that the Sadducees would react like that. Not least because the Sadducees, of course, would get a cut. They would get a cut from the traders who would slip them a backhander to be allowed into the best places for trading. So there was a financial implication for the Sadducees, as well as a challenge to their power. When children are crying out, Hosanna to the son of David, they are anxious because of the messianic fervor. The Sadducees were only left alone to run the temple by the Romans if they kept everything in good order. And if things got out of hand in the temple, the Romans would quickly step in, push the Sadducees and the priests aside and take over. And so the, the, the rhythm of the temple worship was an uneasy alliance with the Romans who allowed it to happen if it kept the people subdued. And so the Sadducees had a lot to lose by some upstart causing things in the temple courts. If the, Sad if the Romans were fearing an insurrection, then the Sadducees were fearing a loss of their own power, status, importance, identity. It was all fine as long as there was no trouble. And their position and importance depended on keeping things according to the status quo. And if Jesus is in the temple courts healing the blind and the lame with power that they do not have, even though they purport to represent God, it's a further unnerving challenge to who they are, to whether they truly do represent God when this man from Galilee can do things we cannot. And so Jesus is clearly an irritant, an irritant to the Sadducees who see their positions threatened. And all of these forces of self-interest and pride, of power and control and force and authority all around. And Jesus broke through all of that to teach the people what it means to know God. And Jesus came to heal the blind and the lame and the poor and the weak and the vulnerable and to receive the praise of little children. And Jesus came to make a way to overthrow the temple tables in order that people could have access to God and not have to put themselves at the mercy of human power and ambition. And so we can understand why when Jesus begins teaching in the temple courts, the Sadducees pounce on him and say, by whose authority? Who gave you permission? We didn't. And Jesus, with his question, calls out their hidden fears of loss and power. A simple question about John the Baptist. Where did John the Baptist's authority come from? Was it from heaven or was it just some ambitious human upstart. And of course the Sadducees were lost for an answer. The Sadducees depended for their power on the approval of the people, on the people believing in them and recognizing them. Our world is full of people who seek and retain influence through other people giving it to them. Today, in France, they are halfway through a presidential election. And President Macron, Marie Le Pen, will be battling it out for the popular vote. Who will give us the greater approval so that we have power to rule? 
but in the world of celebrity or social media influence in a hundred other ways. Power is propped up by popular agreement. People who give their vote or their like or their following to another. Cancel culture is the opposite of that, where the crowd withdraws their approval and someone's position or influence collapses. As long as people give their power and support, then power, uh, give their support, then power is propped up. And so it was for the Sadducees. So it was for these priests. As long as the people propped them up, they would have power. And so the Sadducees didn't dare answer the question about John the Baptist. Because the people loved John the Baptist and had seen the hand of God in his ministry, recognizing him as a prophet. And so they didn't dare say that John the Baptist was not from God, because to do so would turn the people against them. But of course, they themselves didn't believe that John the Baptist was from God, because he wasn't one of them. When we look to people for our identity, approval, or support, we're sunk. Because sooner or later, it will dwindle or disappear. Sooner or later, we may do or say something that other people don't like or approve of, and our world collapses. The only approval that we need or seek is God's. The only approval that counts and endures is God's. The only being right in the eyes of that matters is before God. I care very little, said Paul, if I am judged by human eyes or by, by, by people. He only cared how he stood in the eyes of God. And so when Jesus asked them this question, they refused to answer it. Why? Because their whole identity was propped up by human opinion and by human approval and by what people thought of them. Not so for Jesus. And he told this little story, this little story of two sons. The first son equating to the tax collectors and the prostitutes. The ones who by their lives and their way they'd lived their lives had said no to God. And had later on changed their minds. Had later on repented through the teaching of Jesus had later on come to believe in Jesus the way, the truth, and the life. They'd said no at the start, and through Jesus they'd come back, and they were finding their way into the kingdom. The Sadducees, by contrast, were those who were like that second son, who had said, oh yes, we will serve you, God. We will serve you. We will do what you want. But in their hearts, had failed to do it. Where God looks for humility, where God looks for service, where God looks for grace, where God looks for kindness, forgiveness, generosity, a concern for justice, a concern for the, the weak and the poor and the lowest of the low. The Sadducees' concern remained steadfastly for themselves. They said they would serve God, but in their hearts they were serving their own interests. And so the risk for us, whether or not we might consider ourselves people of influence or power or not, is who are we living for? Are we living for God or are we living for the approval of people? Are we doing what He calls us to, living lives of repentance and humility, loving others as we love God? Or are we just concerned that other people love us? Just concerned that we get the most we can in terms of power or control or influence. Jesus had come to speak into and challenge the hearts of even the most powerful people. And yes, of course, we know that the road that would, will take us through this week is the road where those powerful people will use their power against them. It will be the Sadducees. It will be the Pharisees. It will be the Romans who will orchestrate Jesus' death upon the cross using every vestige of their human earthly power to kill and destroy the one who brings the message of the true kingdom of God. And of course, we know the end of the story. Earthly power does not triumph. 
It doesn't triumph in the world of human celebrity. It will not triumph where unjust wars take place in Russia or other parts of the world. Emperors, emperors, kings, and rulers and dictators will rise, but they will also fall because the only kingdom that will prevail will be the kingdom where its citizens bow the knee to Jesus Christ, who is the true King of kings, the true Lord of lords. It is and will only ever be that one kingdom that will prevail, that one vineyard that will bear fruit. And we may have said no in the past to God by our actions, reactions, or our conduct, but God's invitation stands and remains to us to change our minds and hearts and say, I will go and work in your vineyard. The danger, of course, is that we are those who say, oh yes, I will work in your vineyard. But by our decisions, our attitudes, or our conduct, we don't actually do it. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, sense of the atmosphere of that holy week and of the power and influence and ambition of so many people in different directions. <coughs> we thank you, Lord, for Jesus' unrelenting commitment to establishing your kingdom in amongst all of the earthly kingdoms and ambitions of different competing forces at that time. And we praise you, Lord, because your kingdom continues to challenge and resist and oppose the dominant kingdoms of our world today. And we have your assurance and we have confidence by faith that Jesus will prevail and that there will remain only one kingdom that will endure. And you invite us, Lord, to take our stand in it, with it, and as part of it. So, Lord, hear us as we pray. Help us to ensure that in what we do and say and how we live and what we choose, we prioritize your kingdom over our little earthly fiefdoms which are passing away. Hear us and help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're going to sing the third and final verse of our hymn. And so now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you all this day and forever. Amen. Amen. God bless you and uh, hopefully I may see you tomorrow. <laughs>